Hello everyone and welcome to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. The goal of this lecture series is to build an understanding of and an intuition for the time-dependent behavior of nuclear reactors. This time-dependent behavior can be broken up into two categories. Reactor kinetics, which describes the time-dependent behavior of reactors without feedback, and reactor dynamics, which describes the time-dependent behavior of reactors with feedback. The first half of this course will cover topics in kinetics, and the second half will cover dynamics. Now, when we discuss time-dependent behavior, it's also important to discuss what time scales we're interested in. Are we talking about milliseconds, hours, years, or however long it will take for Half-Life 3 to come out? In general, there are three main time scales for reactor behavior that we can consider, short, medium, and long. Short timescale phenomena take place over milliseconds, seconds, or minutes. Short timescales are important for reactor transient problems, reactor startup, and most importantly for kinetics problems. As such, we will mostly limit this course to discussing short timescale phenomena. Medium timescale phenomena take place over hours or days rather than seconds or minutes. Examples of medium timescale phenomena include xenon and samarium transients, which can take place over hours or days, due both to the longer half-lives for these isotopes and also to the fact that it takes longer to build an equilibrium concentration for these isotopes. Long timescale phenomena take place over months or years and generally describe the gradual process of transmuting different isotopes into other isotopes or slowly depleting the reactor fuel. Medium and long timescale problems are generally solved quasi-statically, which means that we assume that the conditions in the reactors change so slowly that we can assume that they're constant over hour, day, or week-long time steps. Short timescale phenomena have traditionally not been solved using quasi-static methods due to computational limitations. These problems generally require an enormous number of very small time steps to accurately model kinetics behavior. However, we have been moving gradually and slowly more and more towards using quasi-static solutions for short timescale problems thanks to the ever-increasing power of computers. However, in this course, we will solve kinetics and dynamics problems analytically, and thus approximately, and in doing so, we will discuss how appropriate these different approximations are and what assumptions we must make. So what are the goals for this YouTube lecture series? First, we want to understand the theory behind solving these short timescale kinetics problems as well as the reasoning behind whatever assumptions we have to make and the appropriateness of these assumptions. Second, we want to develop an intuition for time-dependent reactor behavior. As any good engineer should do, we always want to develop an intuition for the kinds of problems that we're generally trying to solve. However, developing this kind of engineering intuition for kinetics and dynamics problems is not always easy thanks to some interesting and sometimes counterintuitive phenomenon. Lastly, we'll want to develop an understanding of the stability of reactors. Proper reactor operation is a lot more involved than just making sure that the reactor doesn't go prompt supercritical, and unanticipated large power oscillations can just as easily make a reactor design as infeasible as one that is prone to supercritical excursions. Another good example, which is one that we'll spend a lot more time analyzing later on in this course, is the assumption that people usually have that having large and negative fuel and moderator temperature coefficients will make a reactor stable. As we'll see later, and this is probably my favorite takeaway from this course, is that it's possible for these coefficients to be too large and too negative to the point where they actually interfere destructively and allow a reactor's power to increase without bound. Now let's start diving into the physics of reactor kinetics. Part of this might be a review for some, but hopefully it's all interesting. Delayed fission neutrons are the real star of the show for kinetics and dynamics. To review, most fission neutrons are emitted promptly, which is within about 10 to the negative 14 seconds of when nuclei fission. However, some neutrons are emitted with a delay, which is usually on the order of 0.1 to 1.0 seconds. These delayed neutrons are known as delayed neutrons. Delayed neutrons are not actually released by the fission process itself, but they're actually released by the neutron-rich fission products. These fission products undergo radioactive decay, 
which can sometimes lead to the emission of delayed neutrons. These fission products tend to have way more neutrons than they would like to have to become stable, so when they undergo radioactive decay to approach stability, sometimes neutrons will absorb the energy of the decay and will be expelled from the nucleus entirely. These neutrons can be emitted if the energy of the radioactive decay is greater than the binding energy of these neutrons. When these neutrons are emitted, they tend to have energies in the 200 to 500 keV range, which actually makes it easier for them to thermalize compared to prompt fission neutrons, which are generally in the 1 to 2 plus MeV range. So as we'll see and discuss later, these delayed neutrons are actually more important, we'll discuss importance later, than the prompt fission neutrons because they're closer to thermal energies. Now nuclear reactors are almost always operated under delayed critical conditions, which means that the reactor needs delayed neutrons to sustain a critical chain reaction. If we remove these delayed neutrons, then the reactor will no longer be critical and it will gradually shut down. As you'll see later, any power increases that can occur in a delayed critical reactor are actually constrained by the emission time for these delayed neutrons. And we'll talk about this concept a lot more in later lectures, and actually a little more at the end of this lecture. A very important variable in kinetics and dynamics is beta, which is defined as the delayed neutron fraction for a reactor, which is simply the fraction of fission neutrons that are emitted with a delay per total number of fission neutrons. Now this beta variable actually depends on the incoming energy of the neutron that causes the fission reaction. This makes sense, as higher energy neutrons essentially become high-speed bowling balls and knock out more and more neutrons promptly when they cause a fission, thus leaving fewer excess neutrons left in the fission products to be emitted as delayed neutrons. Because of this, the delayed neutron fraction begins dropping significantly once the energy of this incoming inducing neutron exceeds some threshold, which is usually around 4 MeV. Beta is also a function of isotope, because some nuclei tend to create fission products that will emit more or fewer delayed neutrons. Some sample values for beta are listed here for different isotopes of uranium and plutonium. You see that beta increases by a factor of 8 from plutonium-239 to uranium-238. So you can see that beta really varies very significantly for these different isotopes. This beta variance actually has some very significant impacts on reactor design. Now because reactors tend to operate in the delayed critical regime, fuel that produces fewer neutrons has a smaller window to be delayed critical, and thus re operators have much less wiggle room before the reactor reaches the dreaded prompt supercritical regime. And we'll talk about this more later, but for a reactor that is prompt supercritical, you'll see that the power can increase at very alarmingly fast rates. So we generally want to make sure that our power reactors don't ever become prompt supercritical. Another interesting consequence of this beta variation is that the reactor's delayed neutron fraction gradually changes over time. And this happens because fuel is both depleted over time and because plutonium-239 is generally bred into the fuel. Now because plutonium-239 has a lower beta fraction than uranium-235, this means that reactors generally become harder to operate and in some ways less stable near the end of the lifetime of their fuel because the delayed neutron fraction that Pu-239 will produce is much less than what fresh uranium-235 only fuel would have produced. In general, the delayed neutron fraction will increase as the fissioning isotope increases in an atomic weight, and it will decrease as the fissioning isotope increases in atomic number. Essentially, the number of delayed neutrons released by a fuel increases when its fission products become more and more neutron rich, and thus as they move above this line of stability for isotopes. Increasing the atomic mass adds neutrons moves them in this number one direction here away from the line of stability, whereas increasing the atomic weight will add protons and moves these fission products more towards a stable neutron to proton ratio, resulting in a lower delayed neutron fraction. Now there are about 500 unique fission products, and about 40 of these are delayed neutron precursors. 
Unfortunately, we can't model all 40 precursors, and so, and as you'll do throughout this course, we usually only model about six representative groups of delayed neutrons. Now, we are generally forced to do this because of three reasons. One, nuclear data limitations. We can't accurately measure the decay data, such as half-lives, decay branching ratios, delayed neutron yields, etc., for all 40 delayed neutron precursors. However, we can measure this data much more accurately for groups of isotopes, so we tend to squish things into six groups instead of the 40. Reason two is differential equation nightmares. Now, modeling all 40 delayed neutron precursors would make for an infeasibly complicated set of differential equations to solve for kinetics problems. And lastly, for number three, the decay chains for these delayed neutron precursors can, would become significantly more complicated due to all the different combinations that one thing can decay into another. Now this point is really just the same as point number two. It's a differential equation nightmare. But these differential equations become so complicated that it's really worth mentioning this point twice. Now let's move on to defining some basic kinetics parameters. These parameters will be used throughout these lectures to explain kinetics concepts, so it's important that we gain a good understanding of what we represent. Now before I dive right into these parameters, I will point out that these definitions should be taken with a huge grain of salt. Each one of the parameters that we will define today will be slightly inaccurate, but thankfully we will actually cover the real definitions for these parameters in the very near future of these lectures. Now, let's say that we want to define the mean neutron generation rate in a problem. A good way of defining this parameter is to take the ratio of the fission neutron production rate, i.e. neutrons per second, and divide it by the number of neutrons in the system. Conversely, if we're interested in knowing how much time it takes for one neutron to generate another neutron, we can take the inverse of this quantity, i.e. the number of neutrons in the system divided by the fission neutron production rate. This is known as the mean neutron generation time. Now we know that the number of neutrons in the system is equal to 1 over v, where v is the velocity, times the neutron flux, and that the fission neutron production rate is nu times sigma f times the flux. So that means that the mean neutron generation time, which is defined as capital lambda, is equal to 1 over v times nu times sigma f. This of course assumes that all these neutrons are integrated over energy and integrated over space, which is not a completely accurate assumption, but it's good enough for some basic problems in this course. Similarly, the mean neutron lifetime, which is the average time it takes until a neutron is absorbed or otherwise removed from the system by leaking, is equal to 1 over v times sigma removal, or if we expand this, is equal to 1 over v times sigma a plus the leakage cross-section, so d, the diffusion coefficient, times the buckling of the system. From this, it's clear that the eigenvalue of the system is equal to the ratio of the time it takes for neutrons to be removed from the system, so little l, to the time it takes for them to be generated, lambda. Now let's take a quick step into the brave new world of bad math. Earlier I mentioned that delayed neutrons allow us to operate reactors under stable conditions, but why is that? Why is prompt critical so bad and delayed critical so helpful? Well, let's assume that we have no delayed neutrons in the system. Now, under these conditions, our reactor's power during some sort of transient would be equal to its original power, p naught, times k effective raised to the power of time divided by lambda, which is just the number of generations of fission neutrons that we see over some period of time. Now let's see how our hypothetical and very unrealistic reactor would behave in response to some transient. The mean neutron generation time for a thermal reactor is about 10 to the negative 4 seconds, and it's about equal to 10 to the negative 6 seconds for a fast reactor. This is just because it takes longer for neutrons to create other neutrons in a thermal reactor because they have to bounce around for a while to thermalize. Now let's see how our two reactors would respond to some transient. Let's assume that our reactor sees an approximately 20 cent reactivity insertion, which increases K effective to about 1.001. And don't worry, we'll talk plenty about dollars and cents later. Now let's assume that our nuclear reactor operator is really, really on the ball. 
and that they shut down the reactor as soon as possible. The average human reaction time is 0.25 seconds, and the fastest human reaction time ever is about 0.101 seconds. Now let's assume that our reactor operator is really, really on the ball. He's the LeBron James, the Tim Tebow, the Hungry Box, or the Serral of nuclear reactor operators. Uh, which, of course, is something that they would be if they successfully completed this course. And let's assume that our heroic reactor operator manages to set a new world record and scrams a reactor after only 0.1 seconds. This all means that this transient is a relatively small reactivity insertion and that our reactor operator responds to it in a nearly superhuman fashion. For a thermal reactor, this transient would have resulted in a approximately 172% increase in the reactor power, which is not catastrophic, but it would almost certainly result in enough damage to decommission our reactor for future operation. This is because thermal reactors like to see slower increases in power so that thermal stresses have enough time to reach equilibrium in the system. For our fast reactor, things are much more dramatic. Because the mean neutron generation time is so much smaller in a fast reactor, it means that our reactor power increases way more before the reactor operator can scram the reactor. In fact, the power will increase by a factor of 2.557 times 10 to the 43. Now, an average supernova releases about 10 to the 44 joules of energy, which means that this kind of transient would transform, for example, UNM's 5-watt AGN reactor into a supernova. Now obviously this math is wrong. We have operated thermal reactors under stable conditions for many many years without constantly breaking these reactors, and we have also operated fast reactors and even had fast reactor criticality accidents without creating a supernova and annihilating our solar system. So why is this math wrong? Now I don't want to leave you guys on a cliffhanger, but I will, and we'll discuss why this math is wrong throughout the rest of the course. In short, this math is wrong because delayed neutrons prevent the reactor powers from increasing at such unbelievably fast rates, and second, because feedback prevents these systems from achieving such unbelievably high powers.